Tekken is my favorite fighting game series ever, but it's hard to say exactly what it does best. Street Fighter outclasses it in focused, timeless character design. Guilty Gear outpaces it with over-the-top speed and maximalist presentation. Virtua Fighter outthinks it. Soul Calibur outswords it. Mortal Kombat outbloods it. But it's still my favorite because it commits itself to a dream that died in the 90s. A dream where mixed martial arts meant something different, where conflicting fighting styles produced bizarre interactions, before our naive imaginations were wrestled down to the bloody mat of reality. Get ready for the next battle. If you want to have a debate about which martial art is the best, you need to know about more than one martial art. Eastern martial arts have been around for millennia, but they're a 20th century addition to America's cultural consciousness. Karate and Taekwondo came home with us after the wars in Japan and Korea. Retired GIs and immigrants set up their own stateside dojos. Then in 1973, Bruce Lee's posthumous breakout role in Enter the Dragon ignited a kung fu boom, blazing a path for hundreds of imported Hong Kong action films and imitators. This influx of martial arts media broadened our awareness of the world's many fighting disciplines. What does katana mean? It means Japanese sword. And the proliferation of stateside instructors gave us the ability to learn a move or two. Grab my arm. The other arm. My other arm. From there, we were ready to join the rest of the world in the real main event. Not exhibitions, not tournaments. We're talking about the time-honored tradition of armchair bullshitting. I think if a kung fu guy fought a taekwondo guy, the taekwondo guy would win. If he used his superior kicking range, he could keep the kung fu guy at bay. But if the kung fu guy gets past those kicks, Mantis hand to the eyeballs. Lights out. For a certain kind of person, me and the guy who invented Baki the Grappler, cooking up theoretical matchups and exploring their outcomes was a hobby unto itself. And the early 90s were a perfect time for that. Most martial arts schools taught a single style that had been handed down through generations. For the most part, techniques were developed internally and tested against practitioners of the same form, resulting in martial arts that were a bit like purebred dogs. They had beautiful, distinctive traits and, in some cases, problems. What Mac and Mike have done is take those techniques already presented and simply change the setting in which they could be used. In my footwork, it's always like a triangle, and I'm always sliding. I want some money, man. You want some money? Without a major showcase to put each art through its paces, their effective power ranking was mostly a matter of conjecture and debate. There was endless space to imagine novel interactions between disparate styles, and fantasy battles played out in schoolyard arguments and action cinema. Also, video games. Did you see that new move? Oh, that was bad! There were one-on-one -on -one karate and kung fu games in the mid-80s, but the fighting game genre wouldn't find its footing until it leaned into the speculative fantasy of mixed martial art bouts. The hugely influential Street Fighter II codified the expectation that each character would fight in their own style. Muay Thai practitioners fought sumo wrestlers, judoka fought drunken boxers, and kung fu guys finally fought taekwondo guys. All of these martial guys were designed to exemplify the theoretical strengths and weaknesses of their arts. Ha Rong could keep you at bay with his strong legs. Le Wu Long could slip inside your guard and pummel you with tricky kung fu fists. But in both games and reality, those unique disciplines would be hammered into submission by the brutal realities of mixed martial arts. 1993's UFC debut was the showcase we'd been waiting for. On paper, it was a martial arts nerd's dream come true. Sumo, savat, kung fu, karate, boxing, wrestling, the thing you learned in your dojo versus the thing you saw in that movie, for real. There were barely any rules and no weight classes. Kathy, what do you think? Let's go, whoa. But very quickly, it became clear that UFC was not going to look like blood sport. It wasn't going to be king of fighters. It wasn't going to play out like the battles we'd constructed in our childish imaginations. UFC took our purebred puppies and exposed their hip dysplasia and chronic respiratory infections. And I'm always sliding. Karate is an art of hard, straight lines. Kung Fu uses more sweeping arcs and delicate forms. When the masters of each art approached each other in the UFC ring, we saw their unique stances, but the moment they touched, it all collapsed into shapeless, violent mush. Ninjutsu versus Taekwondo ended on the ground. Five Animal Kung Fu versus Wing Chun ended on the ground. 
Nobody looked like they were doing the martial art they said they did, and nobody looked confident. The winners were the rare freaks who wanted to be on the ground. To survive in the world of UFC, fighters set aside their old labels and took up a new one, mixed martial arts. As the years went by, we said goodbye to Kung Fu guys, and Jiu Jitsu guys, and Kempo guys. The most successful MMA guys developed a house style that borrowed the most effective techniques from lots of martial arts like boxing, judo, Muay Thai, wrestling, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. The sport got more popular and more entertaining, but it also became clear that it was never going to be the Kumite we had imagined. Martial arts had to be compromised when they are translated into video games, too. Lots of games leveraged the appeal of seeing which martial art would win in a no-holds-barred showdown, but everything had to be adapted to work on a flat plane. It goes without saying, but most martial arts make use of all three dimensions. Bodies can move in arcs, slinging spinning kicks and hooking punches. A boxer can dip under a punch or back away, but with deft footwork they can also slip past the attack. But on a 2D plane, representing those techniques is a challenge. Devs have to thread a tricky series of needles, making each punch and kick evoke its real-life inspiration, while also moving at the accelerated pace of fighting game frame data, and staying legible from a 2D perspective. In Third Strike, you can see how the very 3D martial art of Capoeira was adapted to a flat plane. Some techniques that would normally spin horizontally have been altered to spin vertically, which lets you see the rotation of the extended limbs. The developers also tried to keep some of the horizontal spinning moves, but the visual clarity suffers a bit. Here you can see they tried to create a nice silhouette for this moment of impact, but the transition in and out of that key pose is a little mushy, especially compared to say Ryu's thrust kick, which has a very clear horizontal line of action. When Elena showed up again in Street Fighter 4, they had transitioned to 3D animation, but they were still on a flat plane. This time, the artists decided to use more visual effects to reclaim some of the movement lost to 2D. Her spinning horizontal kick and lots of her spinning moves are now accompanied by long, arcing motion lines to sell the rotation. The developers created an abstraction of Capoeira to better portray the spirit of Capoeira within the constraints of the game. This is true for any martial art that gets translated into a video game, and it's especially true in 2D fighters. But Tekken sets itself apart from most fighting games by using all three dimensions. Hybrid mocap hand tune animations showcase each stance, movement, spin, and flourish in their full glory. By design, Tekken runs at a slower pace than most fighting games. That means that real strikes don't need to be altered as drastically to match the game speed. An animator on Street Fighter has 16 frames of animation, or one quarter of a second, to sell the complex motion of a dropkick. In Tekken, that same dropkick can unfold over a comparatively leisurely 28 frames. Even though Tekken's animators still bend and break character models to sell the speed and impact of moves, their use of 3D animation reduces the abstraction. That makes it easier to draw the line between the martial arts you've seen in the dojo or on the silver screen and what you're seeing in the game. In other words, when I play Street Fighter, I'm amazed by the developer's ability to translate martial arts movements into impactful, responsive animation. But when I play Tekken, I'm amazed by the martial arts. Compared to a lot of other fighting games, Tekken makes fewer compromises with its presentation of individual martial arts, and that makes it special. But even more exciting to nerds like me is its resistance to compromising the weirdness of style versus style clashes. Most fighting games are tuned to avoid the clumsy, confusing, interdisciplinary matches we saw on the first few UFC cards. So while real-life practitioners of Judo, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and Capoeira all have drastically different techniques and objectives, their fighting game representations have to fit a common framework of strikes, combos, low overhead mix-ups, and guard-breaking throws. Invisible rules keep the fight exciting and readable. In Street Fighter and most 2D fighters, when a character gets knocked to the ground, they automatically stand back up with precise timing. That wake-up window is a huge decision point for both players. With excellent spacing and timing, the attacker can use a media attack to maintain pressure. The downed player can gamble on a potentially unsafe wake-up super. But the decision most fighting games don't allow is simply staying down. Once again, Tekken's approach is weird and cool. In 1976, Muhammad Ali and Antonio Inoki agreed to a fight. Ali was perhaps the best boxer alive. Inoki was a professional wrestler. Most wrestlers of the era refused to admit that they fought in fixed theatrical contests. 
and Inoki seemed particularly keen on establishing himself as a legit tough guy. Historical accounts disagree on exactly how the match came to be and who decided on the rules, but when the bell rang, it got weird. Toe to toe with one of the world's most prolific head punchers, Inoki went Tekken mode. He laid down and he stayed down. Inoki was staying down, keeping the head out of the way. Ali, who had trained his whole career to strike with speed and power, suddenly realized that he had never trained how to punch downwards. His one and only weapon, deadly as it was, could not reach Inoki. His hitbox was too damn low. Inoki scooted around the ring, bloodying Ali's legs with kick after kick. Ali threw ineffective punches and goaded his opponent to stand back up, but Inoki refused to put his head in the knockout zone. And I'm always sliding. The match ended in a split decision, and the audience threw trash in the ring. It was a shitty, boring fight, and if I had paid to see an all-out wrestling versus boxing fantasy match, I would be disappointed too. But looking back at it, it's also pretty cool. Inoki, clearly outmatched in an exchange of punches, examined the rules, then used the one weird trick that would make boxers hate him. This proto-MMA moment, despite being awkward and anticlimactic, still had a sense of novel experimentation. 95% of a Tekken match is fought by standing opponents, but King specifically pays tribute to Inoki with this combo of cheeky low kicks. And any character can stay down for as long as they like. You can train your combos and pokes and know your safe mids, but none of that means anything if it all whiffs uselessly over a motherfucker laying flat on their back. When you run into somebody using this tactic in the wild, you might find yourself feeling a bit like Ali, robbed of your trusty weapons, unsure of how to safely approach. Tekken's commitment to allowing these odd interactions makes it feel more than any other fighting game like a martial arts sandbox. This is thanks to Tekken's hitbox system. In 2D fighting games, who hit who is determined by invisible boxes creatively called hitboxes. If your red box overlaps with their green box, that's a hit. Most of the time these boxes are tuned for function and feel, and aren't really concerned with accurately modeling your fighter's body. But Tekken uses stacks of cylinders and invisible lines drawn in 3D space. Ah, uh, look, look, look at Lee's squishy hitbox. Look at that. Look at that. That's why he evades so much shit. This 3D hitbox approach models the action in a lot of detail, and you can see its full potential in tool-assisted matches. Creators like Cheese Yoni choreograph unbelievably cinematic fights full of six sidesteps, ducks, parries, and near misses. Your Tekken matches probably won't look like this, but the moments when they do are just so exhilarating. Watching the arc of a Muay Thai kick swing at a boxer's haymaker in slow motion, appreciating their form and trying to predict which will find its mark sooner, and if it'll be enough. Obviously, MMA's evolution hasn't crushed our desire to see masters of distinct fighting disciplines clash. While a hybridized MMA style has mostly pushed the old-fashioned purists out of the UFC ring, the same hasn't happened in fighting games. In fact, the MMA guy has been absorbed into the fighting game canon, where they go blow for blow with the karate, taekwondo, and kung fu guys they strangled in the UFC ring. You might think that it would be a mood killer inviting the guy who won to the who would win discussion, but maybe creativity, curiosity, and debate were always more important than definitive answers. The naive 90s dream of the ultimate martial arts tournament is alive and kicking in fighting games. But if you want to experience that dream at its weirdest and most exciting, you've got to play Tekken. And I'm always sliding. <laughs>